audience, audience uh, uh, to our online audience. Uh, on behalf of the co-conveners from this session, uh, the session, Rain Matter Foundation, uh, ETRI, uh, the FEMSA Foundation, and my colleagues from the IDB, I welcome you to this second session, uh, Tools for Evaluating Ecosystem Services and Nature-Based Solutions. Uh, this is the second session. We already had a session on Thursday uh, in which uh, we made the point that uh, according to research, by 2050, 23 trillion dollars will be the losses caused by climate change. And that shouldn't come as a surprise because if you turn the news today, uh, everything is about Pakistan losing 10 billion, um, the United States having floods and droughts uh, that are gonna be very costly and very expensive. Um, the truth is that our governance, our engineering, our norms, uh, and then the protocols that we have have been developed uh, with a norm that is no longer ex that, that no longer exists, that is no longer viable. And in, in the reinventing of these uh, new protocols, new forms, new governance that we ought to em embrace, nature-based solutions and ecosystems have proven to be very effective and very good in terms of mitigating and adapting uh, our water resources to climate change. Uh, in the first session uh, that we had the other day, we were showcasing new methodologies, new techniques, new, new technology that is going to help us evaluate these ecosystem uh, services and these uh, nature-based solutions. In this session today, what we want to do is want to, we want to learn and we want to understand from uh, the different challenges and the different solutions that the implementation of these nature-based solutions uh, are facing and what can we learn from them so that we can uh, face the, the, the mitigation and the adaptations of the effects of the climate change. Uh, and then uh, it, before we start, I would like to introduce my colleague, uh, Marilyn Mariam uh, Barnkes. She is a young scientific programming committee member uh, she, is, uh, she works for Vision 360, a sustainability management consultant firm based in India. She holds a master's in environmental engineering and a bachelor's degree in civil engineering as well. Uh, Miriam, the floor is yours. I'm curious for today's session. Um, so as I said, you were saying this is session two of our seminar, challenges for implement challenges and solutions of implementing nature-based solutions. So we're going to try and dig deeper to understand what nature-based solutions are, what are the obstacles, what are the opportunities that we have to implement nature-based solutions on ground. And today we have a great keynote speaker for you who will provide it, provide some much needed clarity on the topic. He's an expert on water stewardship water security, agriculture, and ecosystem services. He's been in this space for three decades and uh, is the managing partner of Alo Advisors, a sustainability consulting firm in the Americas and Europe. He's also been serving as a treasurer of the Portuguese NGO SPEA since 2019. So please put your hands together for a very warm welcome for Mr. Peter Penning. Okay, cool. So I'm going to talk about uh, implementing nature-based solutions today. Uh, so four words, three concepts, seems very simple. But a lot of the challenges and difficulties that we face when we're dealing with nature-based solutions are actually locked in to these words. So I'm going through words today, one by one, and I'm going to show you what the issues are that we see when we're implementing nature-based solutions around the world. In my case, particularly in Latin America, because we work with the Fundación FEMSA on, on water funds in Latin America, and we see a lot of these issues popping up almost daily, weekly, whatever. So we are, we are um, going through that today. Next one, please. Can we start with solutions? Very obvious, right? So let, let's start <coughs> with the problem there. And amazingly, I've been in sessions this week about nature-based solutions and nobody says the word problem. And that to me is a tremendous red flag because the solution belongs to a problem. So what we need to do to be effective with nature-based solutions is actually come up with a proper problem statement. What is it that we're trying to solve? 
right? And if you <laughs> if if you work on the problem statement and you are going to address that real problem, you will not face any of the credibility issues that were mentioned in previous sessions as well. Credibility is a big thing because nature-based solutions, you all know, you have to go a little bit further to bring your case. It's easier just to start pouring concrete, build a wastewater treatment plant. But for nature-based solutions, you just have to go a little bit further because you know exceptional results require exceptional proof, right? So once you've got that credibility, because you're addressing a real problem, you will find that things will be easier for you. It's never going to be easy, but it will be easier. Um, and a good problem statement will actually help you to find the right solution, which is also very important. If you start with a solution looking for a problem, and recognize this, then you're in trouble. You are in trouble because you are going to be clutching at straws from day one, because you need to solve the problem. And I saw in the program, I think it was, it was a statement by demonstrating the nature-based solutions can be the same or can deliver the same or better benefits as green infrastructure. I can, with lower investment costs. And I thought, that's, that's nice that you want to demonstrate that, but why bother, right? If your nature-based solution addresses the problem, it should be straightforward. You don't have to prove anything. You, you, we have a problem, we're going to solve it. We're done, right? So why is there this need for, for evidence and things like that? I think, I think personally think that that's because the problem was ill-defined. So you're not addressing the problem. You're talking about other things and then you lose people. You lose people. Nowhere in real life can you just come in and say, I've got some benefits here. No, you really want to buy this because of the benefits. Say, but I don't need it. Well, no, but it's got benefits. Actually, it's got a big list of benefits. No. I can list more benefits, but I don't need it, all right? So some salespeople are very successful with that, but it's not a sustainable way of dealing with that. So keep that in mind as well. And I think good solutions could actually be a combination of green and gray, because you need to find a solution that is fit for purpose, right? You want to solve that problem. So as I said, we don't really need benefits. Um, and there's been a lot of discussions about that, and I. I may upset some people, and I'm perfectly okay with that. If I lose my job, I get unemployment benefits. That's nice. You know, I don't start a country where I, I get those. It is also very nice, but it doesn't solve my problem. My problem is that I need a new job. And, and I want you to start thinking about, you know, these problems that we see with water security and the relevant nature-based solutions in the same way. You need to solve this problem. And for that, you need to do root cause analysis. Again, you know, very simple and everybody thinks they understand this. But to give you an idea, when we um, you know, do root cause analysis in, in Latin America for these water funds, it's easier said than done. We get a team together of up to 10 people for a week to go through the root causes. Detailed root cause analysis is really important and it's really hard to do. And you have to break through all sort of dogmas. You, when we do this, you wouldn't... Well, if I got $5 for every time somebody mentions the word campesino, as, oh, we need to think about the campesinos. Yeah, but is it the root cause of the problem? No, it isn't, but it gets mentioned so many times that I would be a millionaire already, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced, right? And, and it's a dogma, because in Latin America, you need to think about campesinos, you need to think about indigenous people, and yes, it's a very important social topic, but it doesn't help us always to solve this water security problem. So that's a dogma we need to break through because it gets thrown into the discussion almost immediately. And we need to do that rigorous root cause analysis. We do the five why analysis. Keep asking por qué, los cinco por qué, as we call them, right? Keep asking why, 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 and then you get to the real root cause. And it's hard, it's really hard. And then once you've done that, and with water security, this is very complex. Once you've done that, you, you know what to do. And I would say you don't necessarily have to address the whole problem. Sorry. You, you can take a, a small part of the problem and solve that completely. So let me run this past you once more. This is really important. If you take a whole problem 
and you do a little bit, it's like you've done nothing, honestly. And we see this a lot, right? A project gets done and it's like 0.1% gets taken care of of the whole problem, right? That's nothing. That's like you haven't done the project. What is much better is take a little part of the problem and solve that completely because now you can go to a neighborhood and say, we took care of the flooding in this neighborhood. Could be a small neighborhood, could be a big neighborhood, doesn't matter, but the flooding is gone. Now that gives you a lot of credibility and it also actually solves the problem. And now it becomes something that other people can say like, hmm, in that neighborhood, they solved the problem with nature-based solutions. I like that. I want that in my neighborhood too. And, and this is not some random sort of made up thing. If you look at Mexico City, right? Very big place. It has a shortfall of about a billion cubic meters per, per year. And by the way, if somebody talks about liters at this, this, this com, they don't know what they're talking about. We're talking about cubic hectometers. That's our problem, right? Huge billion cubic meters per year shortfall. They pump out two billion. So what's the problem in Mexico City? Is it that, you know, subsidence, not enough water, flooding? No, there's just complete imbalance in their, their water management, right? If you get two billion for free, you pump it out, and then you need to get one billion somewhere else. That's not very smart. So to make that city smarter, you need to create storage. And to create storage in the whole of Mexico City, you're not going to be able to do that, right? So you need to take one neighborhood and just make that neighborhood more resilient by changing the infrastructure, changing the roads, creating these little water parks. There's a lot of things that you can do. And I'll give you some more examples later. If you have a reforestation solution and you go to Mexico City, and I want to do a reforestation, then I increase the infiltration. Okay, cool. And I calculated that, because I do that, one billion cubic meters. You need five million hectares of land reforested. Five million football fields. That's a lot. It is actually the size of Uganda, right? So near Mexico City, you need to find a piece of land the size of Uganda, plant it with trees, and then you deal with the same problem just as effectively. So you can imagine how difficult that is. It's impossible, actually. But you already got the 2 billion cubic meters. So if you look at nature-based solutions as looking some for a problem, then using nature-based solutions like reforestation in Mexico City to address the $1 billion deficit is wrong, right? It's misguided, it's wrong, it will never ever solve your issue. So if that's your nature-based solution, you lose credibility, nobody believes you. Whatever the co-benefits are, right? So that's extremely important. China does this a lot. Um, so People Republic of, of, of China, I should make the difference nowadays. Um, they have these sponge cities, right? Um, they do a lot of infrastructure in the city itself, which is nature-based. There's parks, there is green roofs, there is all sort of infrastructure uh, on the gray side as well, like, you know, channels and basins and things like that, to keep the water in the city as long as possible. And that helps with storage. That is the kind of technology and, and approach that we would like to see happen in, in Mexico City as well, because honestly, that's the only way to get, you know, the $1 billion deficit is by making those neighborhoods you know, much more uh, resilient and keep the water there as long as we can and hopefully be able to reuse it and address that deficit. So I get very excited about that sort of nature-based solutions because I think it really addresses the problem. Okay, so next problem, the next word, please. Next slide. Implementing. Right, so we've, we've done our work, right? We've got the problem statement done our root cause analysis. We know what kind of interventions we want because we decided what are the transformations. Like in Mexico, the transformation is storing more water. That's the transformation, so how do we do that? One neighborhood, two neighborhood, 20 neighborhoods. But now we're going to implement. And we're all nice people, right? And we're doing the right thing. But just because you're doing the right thing, just because you're working with nature, 
doesn't mean that everything else will go automatically, right? You still need good implementation. I would challenge you, I would say that the biggest challenge to nature-based solutions is implementation, professional implementation. You would never ask a medical doctor to build a pharmaceutical factory, but you are asking a biologist to be the project manager of a nature-based solution project because he understands the trees, she understands the river, the hydrology. I get that, but you probably need for these very complex, very large projects, professional project managers, right? Because it's a different skill. I'm, I'm not saying that the, the persons who are doing, you know, the design and the work on these nature-based solutions are, you know, not good at the job, they are, but they may not be the best person for that job. And you always need to find the best person for the job because I, I said this before and Sergio and I have talked about this as well. This water security thing is so important that we can't afford to work with amateurs. We just can't afford it. Sergio mentioned some of the examples. That's a lot, a lot of dead people. That's a lot of livelihoods uh, spoiled. I, I don't want you know, an incompetent project manager dealing with that. Sorry, you know, I'm, I'm worried about my grandchildren. You know, this, this requires professionalism. So no fuzzy thinking either, please. So we talked about the co-benefits. I, I, I wrote down here sideshows, distractions, right? So if you are building something, you know, as a construction engineer, which I used to be in a gray past, um, you don't want to be distracted by all these other things. You've got a problem to solve, you've got a project to implement. That's what you do. So you need other people to worry about the co-benefits or whatever it is, right? So for me it is, Okay, got the problem, we solve the problem, then the solution brings in co-benefits, fantastic. So we saw some work on that yesterday. And we can use that work to look at other problems from other people and say, hang on, that person needs carbon. I just done a lot of carbon planting, they call trees. Uh, maybe I can connect that person's problem with a solution that I already have. To me, that is a much better way of using the uh, you know the co-benefit concept is you know you do the project for a reason and yesterday we saw coca-cola um, kind of bring into practice a couple of these these thoughts right first of all they took a small problem and solved it completely yes. then they looked at the co-benefits and decided hey you know there's other beneficiaries and we solve their problem too so that's the way of thinking and i think if we start doing that much more nature-based solutions will become more acceptable because, you know, exceptional results require exceptional proof. Um, so, having said that, I want to give you an example of um, nature-based solutions and implementation. Um, how, how effective it can be is if you think uh, supply chain, right? So, SOS Mat Atlantica, they source, they plant, they transport, they have greenhouses, and if you replace saplings or seedlings with electronic components, it just reads exactly the same as you know, a normal supply chain in Apple or Microsoft or whatever, right? So it's so very important. Then finally, I want to go to nature-based. I talked too much already, I know. Nature-based is nature-based, it's not nature. Anybody in this room who believes nature is perfect should read On the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. It's not, it's rubbish. Nature-based photosynthesis, 11% efficiency. People-based, 25 at least, right? And that's theoretical, 11%. Practice, it's lower. So assuming that nature will do the job? No. It's much more interesting to look at nature and do what we did with agriculture and just give it a nice human input work very hard and make it better by being nature-based. So agriculture can feed the entire around in nature, a hmm, couple of million max, right? So I think the thinking about nature-based is much more powerful. And there's a very nice, and if you follow me on LinkedIn, sorry for the plug, I will, I will post, because I don't have time, sorry, I will post a very nice nature-based 
project in Oman, where they solve this tremendous problem of produced water with oil by using a constructed wetland. It's super interesting. I'll refer you to that. And I just want to take the last few seconds, Giovanna, sorry, uh, to take you through the conclusions. I, I think whatever you do, whatever the problem is, you start with a problem statement. You work methodically to identify the root causes. You define, based on the root causes, what are the transformations that you need to do. You look for the right intervention. Once you've selected an intervention, you implement that intervention very professionally. And you do it not for the whole problem, because you will get lost in this enormous size problem, but you do it for a small part of the problem, you get the credibility, and you scale based on credibility with proven results. And I tell you, I can assure you that if you have a solved problem, it is way better than any co-benefit or other benefit that you can imagine because you've solved the problem, you know, taken away the issue off the table. Everything else is a sideshow. So with that, I would like to thank you very much and I'm looking forward to the discussion later on. Thank you. Um, thank you, Peter, for that fantastic talk. Very sorry you had to pack in so much of information in 15 minutes. I'm sure it's given the audience a lot to think about. Um, but in the interest of time, we're going to move ahead with the next agenda, which is uh, continue the conversation on uh, challenges faced from implementing nature-based solutions on ground and the real opportunities that are present with a great panel of experts. So I'm going to request Anna, Perry and Priyanka to join me for this panel and take their seats so that we can begin the discussion. I'm going to do a quick round of introductions so that we know our panel a little better. Anna Laura Elizondo is the Head of Water Security Projects at the FEMSA Foundation. She has overseen the management and development of FEMSA's water initiatives, such as the Water Ties and Water Funds programs. Previously, she served as Sustainability Executive for Coca-Cola FEMSA. Periodo is a research scientist at NASA, working at the intersection of data science, decision making and remote sensing. He's currently working to develop an international water strategy for the Applied Sciences Water Resource Program. Dr. Priyanka Jamwal is a fellow at the Center for Environment and Development at the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment, India, where she runs the Soil and Water Quality Lab. She also works on pollution abatement, both through conventional wastewater treatment and nature-based solutions. And of course, our very own keynote speaker, Mr. Peter Penning. So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to give Peter a breather and I'm going to start with Anna. So FEMSA Foundation is a partner of the Latin American Water Funds Partnership along with the Inter-American Development Bank, the Global Environment Facility, the International Climate Initiative and the Nature Conservancy. We are strongly committed to contribute to water security in Latin America and the Caribbean through the creation and strengthening of water funds. So what can you share with us about you know, the challenges, the lessons learned from implementing nature-based solutions in Latin America and the Caribbean? Thank you, Marilyn. Um, great. Let me start just by emphasizing what you just said is FEMSA Foundation commitment for water security in Latin America. Next, please. We have been in this Latin America Water Founds partnership for 11 years now. And it's, it's been great, it's been a great journey, and it has its own success, but also challenges. We have identified four key success factors, which they are also a, challenges, a challenge to implement. Uh, one would be collective action. We need to agree on what are the challenges, what is the problem, what is the, the solutions we need to implement, and we need to have the same aligned vision, the, the whole sectors, the whole stakeholders for to, to really solve a problem. The second one would be, we need science to prove, right? We need data on the table to help us make the right decisions, to make the right calls, and also um, it help us to enable a decision-making process. The third would be governance. We need these structures to to um, to understand what are the roles and responsibilities each one of the stakeholder has to implement great solutions. And the fourth one would be we cannot aim to achieve water security without 
NBS, Nature Based Solutions, of course. Next one, please. Um, I'll give you four examples where we are implementing nature based solutions. One would be, and I think Peter just mentioned a few of them, one would be Guanajuato, Mexico, where we are implementing a project of sustainable agriculture. We are trying to mitigate the huge deficit that's on the state uh, with water savings. The other one would be Mexico City. Um, we are implementing a water district with our partners, WRI, Oru, TAF, and the University of Tec de Monterrey. Um, this water district, of course, is in the city, and we are integrating infrastructure for alternative and decentralized management of urban waters, including collection, treatment, reuse, retention, infiltration. The third example would be Costa Rica, uh, where we, um, we foster for forest protection, conservation projects, Projects, replenishment projects, and it's doing really great. In Brazil, last but not least, uh, by recovering biodiversity. So, so such an important mar matter. Um, next, please. So, I just talk about some of the great NBS that we are implementing, but the challenges really are funding would be <laughs> the first one. The gap is still huge. But in order to get more funding, we need to be able to, to prove that these projects are really working and they're making progresses. And we need to, in, a, in order to prove that, we need data. We need to use technology. We need to, uh, to bring remote sensing. We need dashboards. We need um, better monitoring and, and evaluation of the projects to keep, to keep, to keep up. Uh, this data will allow us to have uh, uh, to build a business case and attract more funding. Of course, we also need funding that believes in these projects to improve measurements and bring technology. So that's what I would add, and thank you. So speaking about data, I guess it's a good segue to go to Perry. So as a research scientist, Perry, you're working on NASA's International Water Strategy for the Applied Sciences Water Resource Program. And this initiative is designed to help leverage the breadth of NASA's modeling and observation capabilities when dealing with complex transboundary water issues. So first, my first question is, what are the highlights of this program? And um, second would be, how can access to data, like Anna was saying, uh, help solve some of the challenges um, when it comes to implementing nature-based solutions? Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, Anna, to setting me up perfectly for this answer here. Um, so I'll start by answering the question that I've gotten a few times at this conference already, which is, why is NASA interested in water? What are they doing unless we're talking about water on Mars? Uh, I know we have a very savvy room of attendees here, and I'm sure those online as well. But for those unaware, NASA has a very strong Earth Science program, which really leverages the uh, vast Earth observation and remote sensing network that it maintains, and also with, with partners in the ESA, uh, Japan Space Agency, and others. Um, these are the best tools that we have for monitoring, observing, and modeling the Earth system, right? And this, this is from the top of the atmosphere to the subsurface. And so this is especially true for water. So I, I'm here representing the uh, Applied Sciences Water Resources Program, um, which does exactly what Anna was describing, right? Taking data to decisions with respect to water resources. But even within the applied sciences itself and the other focus areas, they all deal with water in one way or another, or most of them at least. Uh, the disasters program looks at hydrological extremes and flooding. Uh, we have an agriculture program, which of course looks at uh, irrigation and soil moisture. There was a great, um, a great session earlier this week on evapotranspiration and open ET. Uh, capacity building has a severe program which works internationally with stakeholders around the world at different nodes. And so our job with the International Water Strategy is to try to understand exactly who across the agency is working in, in the field of water, what capabilities they're using, who they're working with, the stakeholders and the partners, and, and what the outcomes are so that we can more efficiently mobilize these resources moving forward in the future. Uh, so part of this is an internal process to NASA, more awareness, uh, and part of it is external, understanding the space of international and transboundary water uh, 
from NGOs to governments to private industry. Uh, so we are working with intergovernmental, intergovernmental agencies like GeoGlows, uh, as well as uh, strengthening our interagency efforts with groups such as the Interagency Water Working Group and the Science and Applications Team within the U.S. government. So, so basically combining the, the forces of our technical agencies to be stronger than the sum of our parts. And we're working in areas like the Lower Mekang River Basin currently and soon to be the La Plata. Uh, and so, you know, ultimately, what does this mean? How can data help, right? And so, like I said before, Earth observations specifically, but also our modeled resources are some of the best tools we have, both for looking conditions now in the moment and sometimes in some cases in near real time, but also on the, uh, the longer records going back decades to understand how the Earth has changed. So I've been a part of uh, several projects which have used Earth observations for the kind of monitoring and evaluation phase of nature-based solutions. Um, instances where traditional evaluation methods, which may require traveling to sites that may be time or cost prohibitive, we can now use uh, Earth observations to uh, supplement those evaluation methods uh, to understand how the uh, nature-based solutions were implemented and are acting effectively. So we have a couple examples I can talk about, looking at you know cover crops in the Chesapeake Bay or the effects of uh, protected areas in places like Kenya. Um, and so data, you know, we're really trying to bring data to decisions and to answer you know, Peter's question, finding the right intervention for the right problem, we're trying to find the right data for the right problem. So. Yeah, that was fantastic. Um, so Priyanka, so as a research fellow, you're deeply interested in developing design principles for the de deployment and scaling of nature-based solutions to address water pollution issues in urban and rural areas. And as someone who's worked extensively in Bangalore, which is often touted as India's high-tech city, but at the same time, it al almost always grabs, you know, headlines for heading towards day zero. So. What, what are some of your insights on how the city can integrate the green, the blue, and the gray? And how do you think nature-based solutions would work in Bangalore for addressing and managing its water quality? Thank you, Marlene. Uh, so before answering your question, let me just give you a little bit background of the Bangalore city as a whole. So Bangalore at present has 14 million people living in 900 square kilometer of area. And uh, if you look at the water and wastewater infrastructure, uh, the population needs around 2,000 million liters of water per day to meet its domestic water demand, uh, which means that 1,400 million liters of wastewater is generated every day. Now, if you look at the official data, it's only 60% of the wastewater, which is uh, only 40% which is treated and 60% is untreated, which just get discharged on, in open stormwater drains. Now, if we look at the treated portion of wastewater, the treatment happens at in centralized wastewater treatment plants and in decentralized wastewater treatment plants. Now, Bangalore is very unique in that case. At present, we have around 3,000 to 4,000 decentralized wastewater treatment plants. Now, the reason we have that many treatment plants is because in the year 2008, there was a notification by the government that every apartment which has more than 50 number of uh, flats need to have their own sewage treatment plants. Now, um, so every apartment has their own treatment plants, but then ATRI did a research on, and it, that policy was called as zero discharge policy, which meant that these apartments are not supposed to discharge even a single drop of treated water outside their premises. Now, given this context, we did a study to understand whether these uh, apartments are complying with zero discharge policies or not. And we found that they don't comply because the, uh, the amount of treated water which comes out from these apartments, they cannot reuse everything. So around 50% of treated water is still available for the apartments and they are just discharging it again to the open stormwater drains which further gets contaminated. So this is the treated treatment, um, uh, like you know, this is the level of treatment we have. And then coming to the amount of like, you know, so as you mentioned that Bangalore is having heading towards a zero water day. So there is a, a, around 600 million liters of water is abstracted from ground to meet domestic water demands. So again, the water levels are dripping. And then in Bangalore, we also have green spaces, which right now 
parks and green spaces and also construction companies which need water for construction and for uh, for for these green spaces which is green green and gray infrastructure so they need this water and currently they are using groundwater for meeting this demand so now we have this uh, we have treated effluent which comes from the uh, apartments and where where we have supply of treated water and then there is also demand from green spaces and from green infrastructure for construction companies now the question is how do we connect this so um, at h3 we are doing this pilot scale project where we are involving various actors which are innovators you know, working with technology uh, uh, to mobilize this uh, demand or to basically bridge the gap between demand and supply so we have partners who logistic partners who will help in mobilizing movement of treated effluent so that there is also incentive for these apartments uh, for treating uh, their their wastewater so this is um, this is how uh, like you know uh, we are uh, trying to bridge this gap and we know that like you know we understand that blue green uh, we can basically implement blue green and green infrastructure in, in the city and coming to your second question about uh, what quality um, uh, so in bangalore we have around 120 lakes and these lakes some of the lakes are restored by the government which means they, the other uh, lakes were contaminated and now they are restored but even after restoration of these lakes there is a lot of algal bloom and a lot of like you know we see frequent fish kill events in the in the lakes so there i think definitely nature based solutions when um, uh, um, deployed along with wastewater treatment plants can help with reducing with removing the nutrients and addressing algal bloom and fish kill problems in, in in the city so yeah thank you solutions partnerships in a way i guess would you know accelerate the implementation yes. uptake of nature based solutions so if you could pass the mic to peter thank you um, Peter, so the question is, um, following the you know, economic crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic, there was, I guess, a general um, burst of interest around the world. Governments were talking about building back better, and there was a lot of um, you know, awareness around this topic. But the multidisciplinary nature of nature-based solutions is often criticized as being opposed to a very siloed government approach. So how do you think governments can help departments, especially at the local um, you know, authority level, yeah. overcome this? Yeah, so it's a great question. Actually, um, I, I don't necessarily agree that it's all the government's fault uh, because we have a job to do and actually what I talked about presenting you know, the solution uh, in a much better framework. Um, and, and if you do that, I think that issue will actually go away not entirely, but for a large part. Um, over the weekend, I, I read this article about uh, Belgium, um, and I know there's at least one Belgian in the room. Uh, and Belgium has this strange problem where there's uh, half a million houses have not been connected to uh, to sewage. Um, that's because the, the country has this uh, peculiar way of, of building villages. Um, it's, it's like ribbons. Um, and it's incredibly expensive to hook up houses to uh, wastewater treatment plants to deal with the sewage. Um, and uh, this, this local authority will say, I don't have that money, I don't have the time, which is even more important for this person. Um, you know, and this is my problem. I need to hook up all these houses in this village. It stinks, as you can imagine. Um, and this problem needs to go away quickly. And nature-based solution that was found was the only quick way to deal with this problem. It wasn't for free, it wasn't you know, superior in any other context, but in this particular context, that was the best possible solution. And uh, they interviewed the mayor, uh, again, local authority, and for him it was a no-brainer, an absolute no-brainer. Um, so I, I think there's a lot that we can do to help these local authorities take these decisions and do the right thing. Um, but yeah, the onus is on us. I, I think we need to design way better projects because you know these local authorities have got a lot on their plate um the governance like you know the zero discharge policy that uh, that you talked about it's rather silly right it's not very well thought through but then you get confronted with these things and they are being confronted with these things that their predecessor sort of invented uh, so we need to help local authorities get over these hurdles i i honestly think uh, they want to do the right thing um, but they just don't know and they don't have the knowledge and that's where we come in. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
everyone for your insights. Um, next up is going to be a presentation of some very interesting case studies that illustrate the successful implementation and valuation of nature-based solutions. So if the panel, if you guys are comfortable, y'all can take the seat and we'll have you back for the next panel. So um, for this case studies, we have stories from Bernice Karimi, a graduate student from Ergoton University, Kenya. Jigisha Jaiswal, senior, senior re uh, research associate at Center for Water and Sanitation at SEPT University. Laura Forney, senior scientist at Stockholm Environment Institute. Danita Horn, scientific technician at Department of Water and Sanitation, Northern Cape. And Professor Venkatachalam, Reserve Bank of Chair Professor at the Madras Institute of Development Studies. And um, to our online audience, uh, we would love for you to share your questions on Pathable and we will have our speakers attend to them now. Yeah. My name is Banis Karimi, really from Ijaton University in Joro, Kenya. I'm going to talk about restoration of water ecosystem services in Kapingazi catchment in Kenya. The ecosystem functions of an, and the environmental supporting services of Kapingazi catchment are systematically being lost due to degradation of upper and middle catchment, undermining the well-being of its inhabitants. The degradation is caused by increased soil erosion that contributes to sedimentation, leading to significant reduction of volume of water of, in Kapingazi River. The high sediment load also ends in the Vatana, thus posing a danger of sedimentation of the hydroelectric dams along the river, which contribute to 52.1% of HEP production of Kenya's electricity. The idea that people are willing to pay for protecting water basins like they pay for other services might sound odd in countries like Kenya, but it, uh, our, our um, research has shown otherwise. Payment for ecosystem services uh, can enhance adoption of sustainable land management practices, leading to improved water quality and water quantity in Kapingazi catchment. The aim of the research was to assess the willingness to pay for improved water services in Kapingazi catchment. Data was collected from 100 households, institutions, and stakeholder associations, and analyzed used descriptive statistics and logistic regression through cross-sectional research design. The results showed that 67% of the respondents were willing to pay for improved water services in terms of water quality and water quantity within the catchment. Respondents were willing to pay an average of US dollars 9.10 per annum in addition to the average water user fee of US dollars 4.19 per annum for improved water services in Kapingazi catchment. Logistic regression showed that Younger respondents being between 25 and 45 years of age were more willing to improve water services than the older respondents. Respondents with larger households as well as those with high school, college and tertiary education were willing to pay for improved water ecosystem services in Kapingazi catchment. Finding out that there was willingness to pay for improved water services ensured that there was potential for implementation of payment for ecosystem services scheme for the restoration of water ecosystem services through sun, sustainable land management in Kapingazi catchment. There is also capacity to influence public policy in payment for ecosystem services schemes in Kenya, which will lead to water catchment conservation in Kenya. The problems exacerbated, the problems described will only be exacerbated by poor agronomic activities, production and industrial activities in Kapingazi catchment caused by land use decisions that which do not incorporate the value attached to supply of high quality water to downstream users and also lead to fluctuation of water quality and water quantity of Kapingazi River. That is why a research like ours is vital to inform and create public policy to protect this and other vital catchments in Kenya and throughout Africa. More support is also required for research like this. Thank you for your attention. I am Dagisha Jaiswal and here to present for the Center for Water and Sanitation. We support the state government of Maharashtra and India for delivery of effective urban sanitation services. This presentation will showcase the journey of 200 plus cities that have started treating the fecal sludge.
Clean India Mission has successfully made the country open defecation free. Its second phase now focuses on safe management and treatment of fecal waste. The highly urbanized state of Maharashtra has continually focused on the entire sanitation service chain. Since 300 plus cities in Maharashtra depend completely on on-site sanitation, it specifically focuses on fecal sludge and septage management services. In this context, it has directed construction of 311 fecal sludge treatment plants. The Center for Water and Sanitation provided support by preparing a plan for design and execution of these treatment plants. Currently, over 200 treatment plants have become operational and another 30 are in construction phase. The government decided to float pre-approved design templates and follow a single window approval system with fund allocations. This approach was taken to curtail the complex and lengthy sanction processes. The key aspects of the nature-based technology are that it makes use of simple systems like gravity flow, drying beds and planted gravel filters. These help in reducing construction and operational costs and energy requirements. It ensures fast-track implementation even with limited technical, financial and human resource capacities. The fecal sludge initially gets dried at the sludge drying bed, capitalizing on the hot and temperate climate of the region. Liquid is further conveyed to baffle reactor and planted gravel filter under gravity for treatment. These units work on the principle of plant-based treatment and filtration through locally available natural resources. Optimal treatment efficiency is achieved from the system and the treated wastewater complies with the national wastewater disposal standards. Great reduction is observed in the biochemical oxygen demand, fecal coliforms and suspended solids. Reuse of treated end products encourage development of new green spaces and livelihood opportunities are provided to the local women groups for the operations of the treatment facility. Seawash team extensively supported the implementation of treatment plants by providing technical support at all levels. A statewide monitoring system and dashboard is developed to track the implementation of FSSM plan. The treatment plants helped more than 200 local governments in successfully treating their fecal sludge and impacting over 12 million lives. Similar model can be adopted in 4,000 plus cities of India and other similar cities around the globe for treating their fecal sludge. Thank you. I'm Laura Plony from the Stockholm Environment Institute and I'm happy to share with you about the work that my colleagues and I did in Quito, Ecuador, where we work with the Metropolitan District of Quito called EMAPS and the Fund for Protection of Water known as FONAG to identify actions for urban water supply reliability. Latin America is one of the most urbanized regions in the world. As you see in the map, Ecuador is located in the northern part of South America and the city of Quito has about 2 million people. The city is rapidly expanding and as a result is facing complex and multifaceted challenges which are exacerbated by climate change. You can see on the left-hand side the extent of the city in 1986 and on the right-hand side in 2019. Climate change poses another threat in addition to population growth. Our analysis indicate that mean annual values of precipitation and temperatures are higher than observed in the past, particularly increasing occurrence of future uh, extreme events. The project made a significant contribution to the city's water master plan, informing a diverse list of adaptation options, including the reduction of the consumption module, the reduction of losses in the distribution network, the expansion of infrastructure capacity, and the continuation of land conservation actions. These actions contribute to increasing the resilience of the urban water supply system against natural shocks, not only just climate change, by volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. The project helped to continue the understanding of the valuable contributions that power areas have in strengthening, strengthening the resilience of the system. These valuable contributions were uh, done by quantifying the benefits of the active efforts of the water utility and the water plants in conservating the Paramo areas and how that conservation is key for ensuring the current and future resilience. 
Under a hypothetical scenario of no conservation, we were able to quantify the values of the paramount line in securing urban water supply using, as a proxy, the percentage reductions of mineralogy for each service zone. As you can see in the graph, under a wide range of future conditions, these values can range between 20 to 30 percent reductions in vulnerability. The Quito project is an emblematic case study of how water utilities can influence the conservation of natural areas and be leaders in ensuring future water availability for expanding urban centers around the world. Thank you. I am Danita Ani from the Department of Water and Sanitation in South Africa. I'm going to talk about Manage Aquifer Recharge, or MIR, in the Western Karoo, South Africa. The main goal of MIR schemes is to recharge an aquifer with as much rainwater as possible, so that the towns will have surplus groundwater during dry seasons. MIR must be done in a cost-efficient way and must ideally require limited maintenance. MIR schemes in the Western Karoo help to combat high levels of evaporation and can provide sustainable water supplies for towns. They can also support ecosystem services where diverted stormwater can be used to create green belts, hiking trails and community food gardens. Each MIR scheme has its own unique design which is based on water resource assessments and monitoring the geology of an area and site-specific environmental and groundwater conditions. There are currently four active MIR schemes in the Western Karoo, with a fifth one in implementation phase in Sutherland. Twelve future sites are also planned. The drought of 2014 to 2019 fast-tracked the planning and installment of these schemes in 2018. To implement these schemes, the Department of Water and Sanitation has created regulations for the development and operations of MIR schemes and are putting it into policies and strategies like the National Groundwater Strategy and the Department of Water and Sanitation Master Plan. Zykwerd and Smyskolk near the towns of Canalfen and Van Wijksvlei are two active MIR schemes. These schemes were recharged by the 2019 rainfall event. The quality of the recharge water also combated iron bacteria that clog infrastructure. At Zykwerd, a first of the MIR scheme implementation cost was already recovered during these recharge events. The current well field at Williston was expanded by 40%, which means new supply schemes have been postponed by five years. Various designs are developed and tested, and the guideline is planned with practical MIR designs for the municipalities to implement by themselves. These schemes focus on low-cost infrastructure that must fit in with the current infrastructure also be self-operational with low maintenance requirements and must provide safe drinking water. Similar MIR schemes can also be created for drought-stricken and water-scarce countries and the rest of Africa. MIR schemes need to be implemented now to combat climate change. They can be implemented in almost all areas around the world to preserve drinking water for the future. Thank you. Hello all, my name is Venkta Chalam. I am currently working as a professor at Madras Institute of Development Studies, Chennai. I have 25 years of research and teaching experience in the area of economic valuation of ecosystem services. Here, I am going to talk about the results of an economic valuation study that I have recently conducted in 80 prioritized wetlands identified for restoration and management in Tamil Nadu, India. We adopted a value plus approach where we documented the prevalence of various ecosystem services and quantified them in terms of physical and monetary values wherever possible. The selected wetlands were rich in biodiversity and other ecosystem services but they are currently experiencing problems such as encroachment. As a result, we are left only with a limited number of ecosystem services and most of them are of poor quality as well. The government of Tamil Nadu therefore proposed to restore these wetlands on a priority basis. So, we estimated two things. One is 
the actual value of currently generated ecosystem services by these wetlands and the maximum potential value of ecosystem services generated by the wetlands in case these wetlands are restored to their full capacity. We have used secondary data as well as primary data. We have uh, uh, used over 5000 household surveys to collect information about the current use of ecosystem services, the problems that these households faced, etc. The wetlands we have found generate ecosystem services ranging from less than 10 and up to 36. On an average, a wetland generates 16 different types of ecosystem services. The monetary values of the currently used ecosystem services have been estimated by using direct and indirect market price methods. The potential value of the ecosystem services to be enhanced due to restoration has been estimated by using the global values which are called benefit transfer values. The estimated economic values of the currently used ecosystem services stand at slightly more than 620 million US dollars per year. The maximum potential value that can be achieved due to restoration is over 2000 million US dollars per year which is 300 percent more than the current value. Therefore, we have come out with the follow following suggestions. One is the estimated potential economic value suggests that restoring the wetlands can generate a substantial amount of social benefits to the society, especially to the poorer households since poorer households are dependent on the wetlands uh, uh, for, for their livelihoods purpose. The coastal wetlands must be restored on a priority basis as they are capable of generating a larger percentage of potential values. Larger wetlands generate proportionately more benefits than the smaller ones, expanding the size of the existing wetlands by removing encroachment and silt can generate relatively larger benefits. While restoring the wetlands, an ecologically benign approach will have to be followed so that all ecosystem services can be maximized simultaneously. The economic valuation reflects a trade-off between different ecosystem services and therefore wise use of all the ecosystem services is recommended. In addition to government, more, more involvement of market institutions, community, NGOs and the corporate firms can be appropriately involved in managing the wetlands. Periodical assessment of ecosystem values of uh, uh, services within the value plus approach is important for informed decisions on wetland management. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm sure this has given everybody uh, lots of questions, lots of doubts, uh, but we're going to get to that shortly. Um, I would just like to, um, you know, share the fact that, you know, we often get very carried away with a lot of cynical thoughts. We want, you know, straight and foolproof tools to implement HA-based solutions, but I think it's important that we share stories of success as well. So I am hoping that it instilled, these case studies instilled some hope into the minds of, um, you know, frontline practitioners of nature-based solutions. So I'm going to request my panel to join me once again. We're going to have one more panel discussion and uh, we'll deal with the questions right after that. So if I could start with Peter, do we have a mic? Thank you. Peter, is that right there? <laughs> Thank you. So Peter, um, after watching all these case studies from across Kenya, India, South America, and South Africa, um, I'm going to be a little cynical here. So, do you think nature-based solutions as a concept has reached everyone? Or is it something that we're still, you know, uh, making the rounds in academic and scientific circles like these? Um, or do you think that common people running high-impact, grassroots collectives and initiatives see it as a positive approach? I, I think so, yes. And I, I think nature-based solutions, uh, I'm from the Netherlands, right? And we're always afraid that we're going to drown because flooding is a major, major thing. And what is very encouraging to me is that in the Netherlands, we got this project called, you know, the river, the river space or something like that. Uh, Ruimte voor de rivier in Dutch. And uh, that is at such a large scale and it's throughout the country. And it's really nature-based solutions. And it was very well thought through. Uh, some of it was actually paid for by the people who got uh, you know, access to the sand and the gravel and things like that. And because it's so big and it's literally everywhere, I think there's an incredible awareness of nature-based solutions being much better in this case than the old-fashioned approach of just making the dike a little bit higher. Um, 
and it's in some other countries, it's the same. I know Kenya is very aware of the potential of nature-based solutions throughout the country because they won a Nobel Prize for it, right? So um, I, I think you have other countries where nature-based solutions could be uh, much more powerful and that root, you know, grassroots awareness isn't there. Um, and, and you may need some of these special events, but there are so many of these special events and successful projects that I think your cynicism is completely misplaced, Merlin, because uh, uh, I think we have all this good stuff. I, I have lots of case studies in, in just in my, my paper, and I do apologize to the online audience because they couldn't hear a word I was saying, um, but it was really good, I can assure you. Um, <laughs> Uh, and nobody threw anything at me. But I think there's an enormous amount of good, positive case studies. And we may want to rethink how we bring those to, to people. Um, there, I think we need to be much more focused, and it won't surprise you, but you know, we're solving problems rather than we're doing good stuff. Because um, I, I personally, I do get very cynical about the, you know, the nice, oh, we're doing this wonderful project and we saved you know, a million liters, and then you do the sums, and it's six seconds of flow through a river, right? Uh, and, and I can't help it, and then I feel cynical. And I, but I also, you know, see what you know what Anna mentioned, right? The water district in Mexico City that's going to one neighborhood and fix the problem once and for all. And I think that gets people excited, not the small incremental sort of things that happen in the margin or even within the, the margin of error sometimes. Six seconds in the, in the river Danube, nothing. Fixing a whole district in Mexico City, super important. And I think we should tell that story, you know, in a, in a different, more to the point way and not, we're doing the right thing, oh, aren't we wonderful? But no, we're solving problems and we're creating a better future for our children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I think that, that's what matters. Right. Get and the message rather than right. patting ourselves yeah. on the back yeah. for yeah. get the message right and, and look at success stories and look at them as solving problems and not doing something nice we don't want to be nice we want to be effective i think that's the message yeah. and that's a great point um anna so as peter was saying based on famsa foundation's experience and being one of the forerunners in the region to invest in nature-based solutions do you think nature-based solutions um, can be implemented at the scale that is required um, and, you know, to pair with the gray infrastructure solutions. So what do you think? Thank you, Marilyn. Um, we definitely need to have in our top of our minds the nature-based solutions and, and think in creative ways, right? Uh, we cannot, but we cannot only expect to implement projects of conservation and reforestation and um, and, rep and replenishment outside of the city and, and, and increase and solve the problem of water security in the city. We live in gray cities and we need to, to, to face that and, and address that. And we need to integrate, we need to green up the cities. We need to integrate both technologies in, 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 in green and gray um, infrastructure for the cities to really solve a problem as Peter was saying. Um, the challenge is huge. We need to keep, uh, keep to keep getting more creative to integrate nature-based solutions in cities as well, and 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 we need to pair, pair it as as I said with with technology. Uh, the the humanity has made progress to solve problems, and we need to take that also into account. So I think it's it's really important. We we can do both, and I will make again the emphasis that I think. We do a great job outside of the city and it's great and it's helping, but we need to start thinking more about how the cities are working, how is the, the connections, how is um, how to green up really, really the cities. So I invite you to keep collaborating, to keep creating, in, 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 to keep innovating and, and investing, of course, in this type of, of solutions. Thank you. So Perry, from a science perspective, um, what do nature-based solutions bring to the table and which other in uh, interventions do not? So I'm just going to try stress on because often the case is that nature-based solutions, as much as we talk about, it often loses a business case, you know, case in many scenarios. So 
think that it is often seen as, you know, a silver bullet for conservation. So if you could just talk about these two points. Yeah, so, you know, I'm a scientist, I have an environmental science background, and so I think for me at least, and I may be preaching to the choir here, the things that nature-based solutions bring to the table is that it's an ecosystem, you know, benefit there. It is the, the associated co-benefits. Um, so whether you're improving um, forest growth for biodiversity causes that has, um, you know, flood control benefits downstream for communities, if you're looking at cover crops for improving water quality that ends up, in, you know, improving the soil health itself, these are the things that we can kind of bring to the table. And, and I agree that they may not be the primary area of concern, these, these associated co-benefits, but they're no less important, though uh, they may be more difficult to quantify. So from a business case, I think it is a challenge to kind of really understand uh, the total kind of monetary benefits of some nature-based solutions, um, but they're, they're just as important, I think. Um, and whether, you know, they're seen as a silver bullet, I would hesitate to consider any one type of intervention a silver bullet. Um, I think it's obvious, I think, to, to really uh, consider each type of intervention in the context in which it's meant to be understood. Um, I was really struck by the kind of the diversity and the flexibility of the different nature-based solutions that we saw in the videos. And I think that is also one of the real benefits, that they are flexible that they can be implemented at different scales, uh, whether that's municipal, whether that's a household level, up to regional or even global. Um, so those are the things that I would um, I would really point to, and, and I agree that often cases, you know, rather than being seen as a silver bullet, it's important to think about them in terms of a, a comprehensive suite of possibilities. So you know, I come from a, a flood risk and, and modeling decision making background, I studied the Dutch system very well. Uh, and so one of the examples that I think about um, as being a success story is the kind of Louisiana Coastal Master Plan. So this is a first, I think, done in 2012. They did a 2017 refresh, and I think they're actually in the process of doing another. Uh, so this is a master plan designed to protect, among other things, uh, the New Orleans area and the southern United States. So in addition to strengthening their levees and their gray infrastructure, which they have done, uh, they've also done a tremendous amount of kind of marsh creation, uh, coastal uh, barrier island reconstruction, um, among other nature-based solutions. So evaluating these things in, in the context of a suite of, of interventions, I think, is really where they're most powerful. Bianca, what about you? So do you think we can unlearn what development means and find solutions using nature um, that can be functional but not destructive in the long term? And um, I ask this because we have perfected our construction methods over the years. So do you think um, you know, we can also accommodate nature-based solutions into our decisions and our solutions? So thank you, Merlin. And I think there is enough evidence now to say that, to state that the importance of nature-based solutions uh, on human health and the benefits of nature-based solutions. And I'm, I'm like, you know, and it's very good to see that various governments are including nature-based solutions as a part of their urban and regional planning. Um, and even in India, there there is initiative in that direction. But the reason one of the reason I think that these solutions are not scaling up is that there is no clear evidence coming from the developing world on the sustained benefits of these nature-based solutions. Like for example, if I give you an example of um, constructed wetlands or floating islands being used to uh, improve the water quality of lakes, there is no clear evidence. So there has been uh, small projects uh, across India where um, the constructed wetlands or floating islands have been deployed, but there is no clear data coming on how much is the improvement we got in water quality. And in addition to that, we think that if it's a nature-based solution, especially when we deploy it for improving water quality, we think that it doesn't require any operation and maintenance, but that's not true. Even for constructed wetland or a floating island, when you deploy, you should know what should be the harvesting frequency of the plants, what type of plants uh, you need to put, and that should go into the cost of uh, deploying nature-based solutions. So one of the things ATRI is also working on is to come up with these operation and guidance manuals because what happens is that uh, as a as a implementer um, when uh, when we go and we deploy some intervention we are there only for th duration of the project and what happens after that what is our exit plan uh, how do we make sure that even when we after we leave how these 
systems or how these solutions, they keep giving the similar, they sustain the benefits. Uh, so how do we do that? So at HC, we are developing these operation and maintenance manuals so that we hand it over to the community and then the community take charge and make sure that the benefits are sustained for longer terms. So I, yeah, so. Thank you. You're right. Um, so that's a very important thing. We also, I guess, a misguided sense of security. Like yeah. it's an HIV solutions you can just implement and you know forget yeah, about, it, about it. But that's often not. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, now I'm going to open it to the audience. You've been very patiently listening to all of it, and um, I would love for you know anybody to kick. Yeah. Here. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. My name is Christian Susan. I work with UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and, and we cooperate with industries on inclusive and sustainable industrial development. And we also try them to tell guys, if you want to secure your water supply, you will have to look beyond your factory fence. You will have to engage in water stewardship. My question is now, it might be a bit provocative, but to Anna, I know Monterey was one of the first water funds which has been established. And just recently, the news came from Monterey that the government was very picky at the beverage industries and saying basically, despite of them being partner in the water funds, that they might have to close, might have to move out. And, and this is what I hear the news. So was this then also an effective instrument for the in industries to save and secure their water supply and also to save and secure their production side? But they say, well, we can prove we have invested, we have done something, we have balanced our water supply, we have worked towards this the water fund might not yet have achieved the goals and targets because it's a long time in endeavor. But I think this is for industries, this is this risk mitigation aspect, which is really the prime element why they want to engage in something. So can you just share your insights on this, please? That's a, a great, great question. I will say a little bit controversial, <laughs> but, um, I think the challenge is, is is huge, and it's not only for for companies really to to make it. We are a huge part of it, but as I said before, it's important to have collective action and everyone take responsibility on on what they have and own and can support and and do. Um, so, yeah, I think I think. And I think uh, Sergio me mentioned a little bit yesterday in, in, in another session. Uh, we are doing something, but it's not enough. And, and it's like kicking the ball. Like the bar is getting higher and higher. We do have, we do make progress, but it keeps um, the bar moving farther. And we need, like I, like I said, funding, data, to keep really uh, understanding the gaps and, and, and questioning ourselves, what we're doing is enough, or do we do something else to improve, and what else can we bring to the table? What else can we do? Uh, what prog problems um, and projects we need to integrate in order to really solve a problem? So, hopefully. <laughs> sure. Can I just add something to that? So. The case of Monterey is also interesting because the Water Fund is working on what is essentially a generation-long process to improve water security for the city. And the drought happens more than once in a generation. And that it actually happens now is also a matter of bad luck in a way, but it's not unexpected. So you can't expect the Water Fund to fix, you know, drought resistance in the seven years that it's been operating, right? Or eight um, it's a generation uh, that needs needs to happen, and and this is something beyond the scope of what the water fund actually can do. Uh, and I th I think what the success story in Montreal initiatives and and got it going, but the authorities, the local authorities, are actually heavily engaged and started thinking about planning for more water for the city, which, you know really is in the wrong spot, right? It, 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 it's a very big city in a very dry place. Uh, so you do, you do need to plan for that. And that movement is happening. So in the longer term, I think Monterey is going to be fine. Um, but I think in the short term, we've just been extremely unlucky. And I, I, I think that you can't blame the water fund or private industry or whatever. It's just bad luck that it just happens now. And we will see these kind of challenges more and more in a lot of cities. So we need to be really preparing for and we tackling into this, these issues and, and tapping into our minds to see 
to get creative in how to to solve. So. I'm just uh, adding to the to to the to, to the to the question. No? I think that the problem is much larger, uh, and then I go back to your recommendation as to look at the problem and where the problem is. Uh, in some of the cities, uh, like in Monterrey, average consumption per household or per individual is 500 liters per day. The problem is that people waste a lot of water, and so and then. The way you frame the question is one way to look at the problem, but there's another way to look at to look at the situation. Is had there not be a water fund, the situation would have been much worse. Uh, and I think that's another way that we need to start looking at uh, the problem. Thank you. Um, is there any other? Thank you. My name is Tom Dyer from Antea Group in Belgium. <laughs> um, so, um, so I thank you for mentioning that uh, case because we know that very well, and it's indeed also a good case on how you solve a problem, but actually get multiple benefits because there were a lot of other benefits. Uh, I liked also the comment about the maintenance cost because it's something that is often overlooked. And in our work working with cities in Belgium, we do get a lot of questions about that as well. We're working with the city of Brussels on a water management plan where we also try to go in the direction of more green blue infrastructure nature based solutions but then how to fund for that is still a, an issue uh, and it ties in also with what uh, Peter mentioned about it's, it's not nature, it's still man-made systems that need to be maintained, otherwise they will not function. So, but I have actually a question more about the tools uh, uh, such as Perry was talking about and the resolution and scale at what we work, especially in a country like Belgium, we're very often looking at relatively small areas where we want to do interventions. Uh, so then how do you, m matching that scale and that resolution is not always easy. Uh, I wonder how you look at that and how, what kind of approaches you follow to f like fight the right balance. Yes, thank you for that question. I mean, that is, that is the key question that we try to answer on a daily basis is what is the right data to answer the problem at hand? Uh, and scale is often one of the biggest issues. So, you know, I'm here representing NASA. I love NASA data, and, and not just NASA, ESA, and, and others who are providing, you know, data for this constellation of Earth observing systems here. Um, but we have to make sure that we have the right tools for the right job. And so it's not always uh, a catch all that we'll be uh, using remote sensing, for instance, to answer a question. There are some of the examples here, you know, there's the GRACE satellite. Uh, gravity recover and climate experiment, uh, which looks at gravity fields, which you can monitor groundwater movement. So that's actually been used in things like manage aquifer recharge. Um, but some of the other nature-based solutions, some of the household level things are just too fine scales for a lot of the sensors that we currently have in place. Um, there are certain tools that are out there who, where they can um, look at satellite altimetry of water heights for reservoirs. If the reservoir is big enough, it can be a really effective tool to monitor you know, near real time uh, understanding of what the height of your reservoir is and what the volume may be. But if you get too small, that may be an issue. And that's not just spatial scale too, it's also time. Uh, revisit times are important to consider. So uh, it is a challenge. Um, we're trying to make the data that we produce, first of all, it's free to anyone. Not a lot of people know that sometimes. Um, we're also trying to make sure that people know how to use, process, and apply the data once they get it. Uh, and, and the last thing I'll say is that there are always uh, trying to kind of close that data gap. So there are new sensors coming online at all times. We have the um, SWAT, uh, surface water ocean topography, which is coming online in a, in a couple of years, which will be just one more tool that we have to look at things like ocean heights, sea level rise, and, and reservoirs. So um, we're happy to uh, make the, the data finding as, as easy as possible. You can look at the uh, the Earth Explorer um, and some of the, the data archives that NASA produces um, and hopefully be able to kind of match the data set to the problem that you're trying to solve. And we have to do, I hate to do this and I hate to cut the conversation short, but I have to do it. So it's, I hope it's been an interesting and an insightful session for both the audience here and the online audience as well. Um, of course, this is not the end of the conversation. This is not the uh, end of the discussion. I hope the discussion, the debates, um, and you know, 
all of this continues uh, right after this conference, right after the session as well, and we all drive you know, the much needed action on the ground. So to wrap up today's session, I'm going to invite Dr. Veena Srinivasan, who is the Director of Center for Social and Environmental Innovation and Senior Fellow at ATRI India. Over to you, Veena. Thank you so. Uh, thank you to all the speakers, the keynote, the panelists, as well as the online speakers. It's been a real pleasure to co-convene this session with Sergio and Merlin. Um, I think that we, we I personally learned a lot from the session. So I'm going to start with first Peter's very, very important point about start. Don't start with the solution. Start with the problem. Do the root root cause analysis, and then match the interventions to the problems that are actually needing to be solved. Very, very useful. Um, and then noting that uh, one of the things in, in actually designing and implementing those solutions, uh, financing remains a bottleneck, Anna brought that up. And uh, the, the question of science and evidence, both to the extent of do these interventions actually work in the way we think they work to solve the problem that we need to be solved? And then what is the value that they are generating so that we can justify the financing? So evidence on both the science and the, the, the valuation side, we saw a lot of interesting case studies across the world, both presenting evidence on efficacy as well as in terms of new ways of calculating value. And I thought all of those were extremely uh, inspiring. And then of course, uh, I think we talked about uh, the data on uh, the innovations and the types of new types of data, both the open data sets as well as the satellite data sets that could help generate the evidence that's required. So very interesting set of uh, pieces of insight coming from those. Um, then I thought uh, what was really interesting from across the presentations and the theme that I thought uh, saw coming up over and over again was the issue of scaling and sustainability. So the issue of you can do a in a single pilot, but how do you get it actually to scale to actually solve problems at at the scale at the scale of the problem? And I thought three interesting messages uh, emerged from the scaling and sustainability um, uh, questions. Uh, the first was the idea that you can't just innovate in isolation. You need to build an innovation ecosystem in order for nature-based solutions. It's not just one stakeholder trying to do one thing, but you need many different people to all work together. Um, the second one was uh, the, uh, the, the, the idea about operation and maintenance and building and thinking about operation and maintenance institutions and mechanisms right from the beginning uh, instead of as an, as an afterthought. Uh, and the third was uh, the, the opportunity to embed in large scale government programs that I thought we saw from the Maharashtra case, which was very interesting because what you can do in one city is one thing, but when you start doing it in 250, just the impact and the potential of that, uh, very inspiring. Um, I'm going to end with uh, what I think are three provocative questions for us to think about uh, into the future and, and the next, the third session this afternoon. Um, I thought three interesting points emerged which were not well addressed uh, in today's discussion. And the first was this issue of time scale because we are, we are used to gray infrastructure being you implement it and then it happens. Uh, I really liked your uh, remark uh, Peter on on generational uh, projects and some of these projects really are just slower processes and do we have the patience in our systems to actually deal with generation scale processes and I maybe nature is slower in some ways so I think that's something to think about. Uh, the second was, was something that Sergio said was I thought this issue of risk minimization versus value maximization. Uh, we've done, we've seen across the last few days all of the nature-based solutions that I've been on talking about value delivered, but not really kind of the delta and how how you're how you're managing to dampen some of the risks. And I think maybe my uh, my concern is that if we don't address these two, which is that nature-based solutions perhaps are about about dampening risks rather than maximizing efficiency or value. And if you're not really able to handle the slower scale that's needed, will we end up with nature-based solutions that are old wine in a new bottle? Some of the things that we've seen we've been doing for 20 years. And so how do we really kind of push the boundary to get that additionality? So I'll stop uh, there and thank you again very much. We have another uh, session this afternoon. Look forward to seeing some of you there. Thank you. Thank you.